the redeemed of the Lord say so Because the world needs to know Let the redeemed of the Lord say so Because the world needs to know Let the redeemed of the Lord say so Because the world needs to know Let the redeemed of the Lord say so Because the world needs to know Greetings. Welcome to Say So, where we talk about it, whatever it is. Because what you do not know can hurt you or someone that you know and love. So let's get to the root. For today's episode, we are going to talk about the power in agreement. And what caused me to uh, want to delve a little deeper and to dig and kind of get to the root of the power in agreement was because I just considered or thought about some of the things we come into agreement with uh, consciously and or subconsciously. For example, um, if you're not feeling well or you're sick, you may or may not come into agreement with a prognosis, which is a professional diagnosis or the diagnosis. It could be a a mental health diagnosis. It could be a um, mood diagnosis or something of that nature um, or some anything that we, you know, come into agreement with. And also, I wanted to know and to note that agreement can also be silent. If someone says something in your company or asks for an opinion or what have you, or just says something that's kind of out of line, but you don't, you do nothing to correct it, or you do nothing to, to let them know that you are not in agreement or that you, you know, um, are on the other side of the fence on this topic, this subject, or this matter, then that silence gives is an agreement in and of itself, right? So we're going to go ahead and get into it. We're going to go into scripture um, about agree, agreement, and we're going to do some definitions and synonyms and um, give some real life examples. And honestly, before we even get started, um, I want to give a real life example that just happened about a few days ago, like maybe within the last 48 to 72 hours. And it was a pretty grim, you know, somebody told me that something was impossible. And, um, you know, of course the scripture, uh, came to mind that what is impossible with man is possible with God. So that was one of those David experiences where I had to just encourage myself in the Lord. And this individual was kind of pessimistic anyway. And basically it was an appointment that, uh, my son and I needed to attend. It was a, it's a require. Uh, requirement or required appointment for homeschooling. And um, it's an evaluation and it has to be state approved or what have you. So even before I set up the appointment, the, the gentleman or the individual was just very pessimistic and was like, you know, just basically love on your child and teach them all you can and do what you can or what have you. But basically saying that it was not needed or necessary for um, him to be tested to see, to establish really a baseline for where he is. And my goal is with that baseline from year to year, we're going to see growth. We're going to see him developing. We're going to see things that he may not have been able to do that he is able to do this year, you know, with just continuing to work with him or what have you at his own speed. Long story short, basically he said it's impossible to, for him to be tested. It's impossible. It, it, it won't happen. Um, he's incapable of doing it or whatever, what have you. And like I said, that scripture just popped up for me or what have you. Um, and I even noticed when we got into that atmosphere, because like, like I said, when I set up the appointment, before I set up the appointment, he was pretty much saying that, you know, it's not needed. It's not necessary. Don't basically don't do it. And I, wanted to just to see where, you know, where he's functioning and what level he's on. So went ahead with it. When we got there, um, it was pretty much more of the same. He was very pessimistic. You could tell just in his body language and things of that nature. So long story short, my son even performed or, um, behaved differently in that atmosphere. And that made me think of like when Jesus was about to heal or needed to heal someone um, or do something for them. And he put out those that did not believe or what have you, those that weren't on one accord, those that weren't in agreement with what needed to happen. This person had been hoping, praying, 
and desiring to be healed uh, whole and set free. And he needed to ensure that the atmosphere was conducive for that. So um, that if there was any unbelief, then that had to go, you know, so that only what was left was faith and the people who believed and who were in agreement on one accord and things of that nature. So that's just a real life example of something recently. And that's part of the catalyst or the reason I wanted to consider um, the power in agreement. So without further ado, we'll go ahead. I'm going to start with the definition for agreement or excuse me, agree. Now agree has two definitions. And the first one is to have the same opinion about something or to concur. Like some people say, I concur. That's basically saying, I agree. Um, another way that we say agree in churchdom or kingdomdom is by saying, amen. That means, you know, I agree with what was just so, what was just said or expressed. Now, the second definition is um, consent to do something that has been suggested by another person. And I would like to um, insert or offered, like somebody could offer to do something for you. They may offer to watch your children or offer to clean your car or offer to give you money or whatever or what, what have you. But those are just examples. Now, some synonyms or similar words to the term agree are as follows. Um, inside, within, Oh, actually, excuse me. Um, eye to eye, like seeing eye to eye. We agree on this topic or this subject matter. Another one is accord, which made me think of the scripture that talks about uh, being with one accord or what have you. When the Holy Spirit came and it was an Acts experience or whatever, and everybody began speaking in tongues in in the um in the when he filled the room or what have you, all of them were with one accord. The Bible says, and that accord just made me think of that. That's agreement, right? To agree and be in one place at the same time, have the same mind, and have the same level of expectation or what have you. Now the next um thing that I wanted to go over in order. To agree, there must be an agreement. So once you agree upon something, a lot of times there is an agreement. It can be a written agreement. It can be a verbal agreement or what have you. But once you're kind of on the same page, you may decide to go forward with something. Let's say, uh, for example, employment. Let's say you apply for the job. You are sitting across from your potential boss or maybe a board um, who have questions or what have you. And at the end, they may offer you the, the position. So when they offer you the position, both of you agree, you agree because you applied for the position. They agree that you would be the best person or best fit for the position because they're offering you the position. Then you all go into an agreement. So you're, there's going to be paperwork that you have to sign and things of that nature. So it's not only verbal that says you're saying, you know, I feel like I would be an asset to the company for this reason or that. And the company feels like I would be an asset or a good fit for this position. So now we have to not just verbally agree, but we also have to put something in writing, right? So that's just an example of two different types of agreements. One can be verbal, one can be written. So the term agreement is a noun. So it's a person, place, or thing. And it reads, and there's approximately three definitions for this one. And it reads as follows. The first one is harmony or accordance. There's that word accord again. In opinion or feeling. So you both feel the same way. You both are of the same opinion. Now it also says a position or result of agreeing. So the example that they gave was nodding in agreement. You know, someone nods, they agree with what you're saying. They concur um, and they're basically saying amen to what you're saying. Now, the second definition is a negotiated and typically legally binding agreement between parties as to a course of action. And um, that is equivalent to like a trade agreement. If you agree to trade this for that, or I will give you this, it's almost like retail and purchasing. I will give you this if you're willing to pay the price or whatever uh, the price tag is. So... That's the second definition for agreement. Now, the third and final definition for agreement is the absence of 
incompatibility. So that means you're compatible between two things. And it also says consistency, right? So you're compatible. You agree. You're congruent on this thing. We're going to move in this direction. We're going to move forward with this plan, or we're going to move forward to establishing a plan when there is an agreement. Now, some synonyms or similar word for agreement is unison. Think about singing in unison where all of the voices blend together. Um, unity, U-N-I-T-Y, like uh, Queen Latifah says, just being united together. Acceptance, accepting something. Endorsement, endorsing a product or something, basically saying that, you know, I'm in agreement with this product in so much that I'm going to push it and um, suggest that you buy it or try it or purchase it or what have you. Now, uh, consent. Giving your consent, that's basically saying yes or no, right? Or your permission. Covenant was one that stood out to me. And um, consider how many times we enter into covenant purpose, purposely or maybe unpurposely, uh, whether you're aware or unaware by what you say. And like I said previously, even not saying anything, that's standing in agreement because you're not opposing it. You're not uh, rejecting it. You're not repelling what has been said or what has been put out there. Another one is packed deal. That makes me think of the uh, previous or old uh, game show of deal or no deal. And... Another one is bargain. Like who doesn't want a bargain? Who doesn't like a bargain? A way to save money or what have you. And uh, let's see. Settlements. Settlement makes me think like if there's a car accident or something like that and whoever is at fault wants to settle or the insurance company wants to settle or whatever, what have you. Um, settle upon a uh, amount that is conducive or agreeable for both parties involved. Well, for the party that's being offered the settlement arrangement arranging to do something at this time we'll meet here at this time we'll do that or the other thing understanding you know the word of god says in all thy getting get understanding so understanding what the other party wants and needs what the expectations are and vice versa a pledge a promise and a bond and you know the word of god says that a man a uh, species man so that means man woman boy or girl a man's word is supposed to be his bond. And years ago, centuries ago, actually decades ago, you only had to give a verbal agreement of what you were going to do in the other person and shake hands. And that was your bond. That was your agreement or what have you. Now, the term uh, promise made me think of covenant because you know that God gave us the rainbow as his covenant, that he would not destroy the world. Um, again with water, but it'll be by fire next time. So, um, covenant and promise go hand in hand biblically. And I also wanted to move forward. Oh, so some other synonyms or short words for the term, um, agreement. Well, we just went over those. I also, the third term that I want to define just to kind of set the foundation so that we're on the same page and we have the same level of understanding is the term in, because I've heard the power of agreement. Um, there, there's like sermons and, you know, articles and blogs and things of that nature on the power of agreement. But the, uh, when I looked up the definition of in, I wanted to definitely highlight the power in agreement. And the term in is a preposition, the definition, and it is expressing the situation of, of something that is or appears to be enclosed or surrounded by something. So that's basically, and um, some synonyms or similar words are inside, within, um, in the middle of as well. So I wanted to look at it from the viewpoint of the power in agreement. So there is power within the things, the people and the places that you choose to come into agreement with, covenant with, enter into a contract with, right? So we're going to move forward and we're going to talk a little bit about the benefits of agreement. Like, why do you want to be in agreement? 
Uh, what are the advantages or the disadvantages associated with being in agreement with a person, with a company, with a product, um, with anything um, that you can pretty much consider? Now, the benefit of agreement um, and one of the ways that a, an agreement is established or demonstrated is through contracts, right? And that's the written form of an agreement. So contracts help to protect both parties from possible legal issues and even lawsuits. So the reason we have contracts and we have things that you have to sign. Think about closing on a house. You feel like you sign your life away. You sign so many stacks and stacks of paper. Um, and then someone else explains to you what it means. If, if, and when you're in agreement, then you sign what they say, your John Hancock or your signature saying that you're in agreement with this thing. And you're, you're, you're willing to be held responsible. Even when you go to the doctor, they typically have you sign electronically uh, about payment and, and things of that nature a few times, depending on um, the situational uh, circumstances. But it's just indicating what your obligation is, what the expectations are, and what your responsibilities are. You're signing um, to say that I'm in agreement with this. Now, Basically, the purpose of a contract is to agree up front so that there's no disagreement later. So to avoid getting sued and lawsuits and going to court and having legal issues and stuff, um, or sometimes when those are present, when you pull out the contract, when you pull out what was said verbally, what was written or what have you, then the judge can decipher through what should, you know, what end of the bargain you should have held up and vice versa. What did you do well? What did you not do? Um, what was in writing? What was your responsibility to this person, this exchange, this individual or what have you? Now, um, it basically, once again, outlines clear expectations. This is what I expect you to do if I'm purchasing something from you. If I'm purchasing, let's just say a new car or something from you. And um, I expect, you know, you may get some sort of insurance or something on it, additional insurance to ensure that if anything goes wrong in a certain amount of time within the first year or within the first however many hundred thousand miles that it'll be fixed. Um, so that is the expectation or what have you. And uh, it's the responsibilities of each party and their expectations. It eliminates confusion. And like I said, it states clearly what you should do, what you should not do, what we're responsible for, what you're responsible for, and vice versa. So when it comes to a covenant, um, I wanted to define that. And literally, it's two words. A covenant is an agreement. And we previously defined that. So um, the promises of God, you know, um, uh, and like I said before, the example of the rainbow. Now, the scriptural backing of uh, that, the scripture that came to mind when I thought about this was, is found in the Old Testament book of Amos uh, chapter three, verse three. And it really poses a question. And the question is, how can two walk together unless they agree? Which is something to think about because that makes sense. You know, if two people, I imagine visually two people walking down the road side by side right if they agree on the destination and where they're going then they're both going to walk in the same direction at any point when there is a question or they disagree with which way they're going somebody might turn back and go backwards while the other person is walking forward somebody might go to the right or to the left they may depart in some way simply because they no longer agree on where they're going or, or whatever, what have you, maybe they're lost. Then somebody's like, well, maybe we need to go back because we know what's in this direction. But if we keep going forward, we don't know. We may be getting deeper and deeper in, into being lost or what have you, or deeper and deeper into unmarked territory or what have you. So once again, we're talking about the power in agreement. So there are two major parts required in an agreement. Now, the first one, and this is a contractual agreement. So this is the written kind, and this is a legally binding contractual agreement that we're talking about. And the first thing is that all parties are in what? Agreement. And that means um, after the offer has been um, given. So once again, if this person says, well, I will give you this if you give me that, then 
and you agree to it, then something is placed in writing so that if they don't give you what they said they were going to give you, or if you don't give them the right amount of money or enough money or whatever, what have you, then you have something legally binding to lean on. And if, like they said previously, if there's legal issues or a lawsuit, then you have some uh, something to stand on and to uh, present. All righty. So the second thing, the second major part that's required in a agreement or a contract that's legally binding is something of value must be exchanged. And um, that could be, like I said, money. If you, I want this car or this object or whatever, then a materialistic item, then I have to give you this in order for you to exchange that for what it is that I want. And this put me in the mind of the, the um, book of the story in the Bible regarding Jacob and Esau, you know, Jacob, um, actually finagled or manipulated his older brother. There were twins and he manipulated his older brother Esau out of his birthright for a bowl of soup for something to eat, um, because he was hungry, but he wasn't starving or anything. You know, it's not like he hadn't eaten in two weeks or something, but anyway, so they exchanged the birthright for a bowl of soup. So that's just a biblical example of exchange of something valuable. And typically um, you want to exchange the value. You want it to be kind of similar or, you know, maybe a little higher, but not really lower. Like when you think of a bowl of soup, number one, he probably ate that thing in about five, 10 minutes or less. And, and your entire birthright, you exchange for that. So the birthright is major. It carries a lot of weight. And this bowl of soup is way down here because that's something that you you could get from, you know, pretty much anywhere or what have you. So that exchanging something of value, it has to be a value to both people. But obviously at that time, Esau the value of his birthright went majorly plummeted, you know, went down and, and he felt that it was equal or equivalent to a bowl of soup, one meal. And he may not have even gotten full, who knows? So that's just a biblical example of exchanging something of value. And that's another we, uh, another example of how people can be hoodwinked and bamboozled because you could think you're really uh, getting something valuable and the person that's selling it or that's exchanging understands full well that uh, you're giving up more than you're getting. But because you don't know or understand that, then you may uh, give something up that is of a greater value than what you're exchanging for or that what you get in return. And that makes me think of relationships. Like if you have a tendency or if you have found yourself ever in a relationship where you've settled, where you've put something of value yourself, your heart, your emotions, um, everything that you are or whatever, your person on the line for something or someone that was not of equal or greater value or what have you. Just another example. So we want to talk about the three important parts of an agreement. All right. So number one is the offer. Number two is acceptance. And number three is consideration. So as it pertains to the offer, it's important to know and to note that the offer hasn't been agreed upon yet. So somebody could say, I'll, I'll give you a hundred dollars for those shoes. Okay. And lesser until you agree, then it's not, you know, there will be no exchange or what have you. You might say it might be like a, um, a raffle. You might say, give me 130 or they, you know, what have you, um, until you agree on whatever the exchange is going to be or whatever that individual wants or whatever you are willing to sell or whatever, or willing to part with, then it's just an offer. Um, I'm trying to think. Sometimes when's the let there's something called an offer letter where they offer you something. Oh, they offer you offer letter with employment. They offer you employment and typically they tell you what the salary is gonna be, tell you a little bit about your position, uh, tell you about PTO, vacation, and all of that stuff. And um, I do recall that. So they will they can send you an offer letter for an employment position. Now, two is acceptance. Are you going to accept it? Is it within your, um, 
Are you interested actually? Um, or do you want them to offer you more money or do you want them to offer to have your own office as opposed to a cubicle or whatever, what have you? Um, is the schedule conducive? Do you need certain days off? Do you have a vacation already planned or what have you? And you need to have that off or something like that. Do you need certain days off certain time of the year? What have you? So acceptance is the act of agreeing to form a legally binding agreement based upon the offer. And once again, the offer letter, you have to sign and date it. So once you sign and date it, then it's legally binding. Uh, you've agreed upon it. So you can't, after you sign it, say, well, you know what? I think I want $10,000 more um, a year because you've already signed it. You've already agreed and your signature is um, an indication of your agreement. So the third important part of an agreement is consideration. And that basically means, uh, number one, it makes it binding and enforceable. Um, without the consideration, it's, it's not void. I mean, it's void is null it's invalid. The offer, um, and all of that. So once again, this is where you exchange something of value for something else of value. Now, the consideration is the main element element because anybody can offer you anything. Um, but if you don't accept it, then it doesn't mean anything, you know? So it's important to know and to note that consideration also val uh, validifies the contractual agreement. So once again, like I said, it's null and void if there is no consideration and, um, and things of that nature. So it's important to know and to note that as well. Another scripture that came to mind in um, the New Testament, actually, this time, or that came up was, is found in the New Testament book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 18 through 19. And initially, I thought of uh, the 19th verse, but once I read the verses before and after it, they all link together so well. So I decided to include them all. So these are Jesus's words. And this entire chapter pretty much is all in red. Jesus is, is speaking pretty much the entire time. So in Matthew chapter 18, verses 18 through 20, it reads as follows. Verily, which means truly. It's a fact. It's true. Truly, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And, um, so it's impossible. It's important to know and to note that to bind something means to make it tight, to make it close, to make it, um, secure to lose something is like taking your shoe strings loose. It makes it looser. It makes it where you can take your feet out and it's not as tight or as binding as when they're tied together really tightly. Um, then it says in verse 19, again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my father, which is in heaven. Now, this is where we get the terminology in Christendom or in Christendom of touching and agreeing. So it's basically saying there are two people. They touch and agree on this one thing. They're asking God. Um, they're asking in Jesus's name or whatever. And Jesus is saying, my father, God, which is in heaven, will do it for you as long as it's in you know, his will or what have you. So then verse 20 says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, here am I in, I mean, excuse me, there am I in the midst of them. And that also makes me think of uh, what happened in uh, the upper room of uh, in the book of Acts, where everybody began to speak in tongue, where the uh, the spirit of the Lord came, came through and um, like a Russian mighty wind. And because it was more than two or three, they were all gathered together. And the word of God says with one accord, that means they were on the same page or what have you. They were all open to whatever, um, the Lord would have to be done or whatever he wanted to do. Now the inverse part of this is also, um, labels. Like sometimes we tend to come in agreement with labels. And like I said, you can uh, unconsciously, 
uh, come in agreement with something by not saying anything, not speaking up, not speaking out, not renouncing it or denouncing it or saying, I do not receive that, then uh, you have just received it simply because you didn't uh, disagree with what came up, what came out, what came forth or what was said. So labels, um, and it makes me think of the saying that says, it's not what they call you, it's what you answer to. So, um, and this is all in the same vein of labels. So I have two columns here and they're just basically opposites. Someone could call you a uh, hurt and uh, versus being healed. Now, one is the pessimistic side or interpretation. One is optimistic. So one is negative, one is positive or can be perceived as negative or positive. There may be some overlap. It just depends on your perception, how you perceive what is being said and also how the um, how it is received or if it is received and also how the person came across that said it. Is it intended? Is it sarcasm? Is it intended to hurt you? Are you arguing? There's a disagreement where there's malice and there's anger and whatever, what have you, or is it just they're honestly telling you the truth in love and you choose to perceive uh, it as something bad or what have you. Now, dumb versus smart. If you've ever been called that or, or heard somebody called that or whatever, what have you in the academic arena or what have you. Uh, fat versus skinny. Um, large versus small. Short versus tall. Wide or thin. Ugly or pretty. Useless or useful. Look at this. The terminology, uh, well, the first three letters are identical, but Depending on what you tack on to the end of it, then that makes it negative or positive or makes it um, come across in a certain way or convey a certain message, right? Worth less versus worthy. Um, sick versus well. Weak versus strong. Bad versus good. Victim versus victor. Hopeless versus hopeful. Once again, that's less or full. You know, less meaning depleted or little to nothing and full mean abundance. You know, there's a lot of it. Um, underachiever or overachiever. And those are just some, like I said, opposites and some words and terminology or labels that sometimes can be stamped on us. It also made me think of labels of like mental health diagnosis. You're bipolar, you're schizophrenic, you have a post-traumatic stress disorder, you have um, a behavior disorder, you have a personality disorder, you have a mood disorder, um, you have a developmental delay or developmental disorder, um, you have this condition or that condition. It also can go as far as physical conditions. You're asthmatic or you're anemic, or you have high blood pressure or low blood pressure, um, you, you're diabetic, you're... Um, you know, obese or whatever, what have you, whatever the diagnosis or the prognosis is, um, these are just labels and we can choose whether or not to come into agreement with them. You could get a terminal, uh, illness, uh, diagnosis, right. Or prognosis, however you want to call it. And you can either choose to come in agreement with it or not come in agreement with it. Now, by not coming in agreement, I'm not saying to be in complete denial, like um, you're gravely sick and you're saying, hey, I'm not sick at all. Nothing's wrong with me, this, that, and the other. I'm just saying, I'm saying if you, it's almost like um, you can choose, like the, the word of God says that God has placed before us blessings and cursings, life and death. And he gives us a recommendation a recommendation that says, therefore choose life so that you and your seed shall live. So in any situation, you have a choice in the matter. You can receive it or not receive it. You can uh, fall victim to it or not fall victim to it. You can fall prey to it or not fall prey to it. It just depends on what it is. It depends on your level of faith and what you're willing to um, receive or, 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 um, or reject, you know, and, even when people, some people, you know, take medication or whatever, or what have you, you have to come in agreement with what they say that you have in order to take the medication. And you may be taking this medication every day, pretty much for the rest of your life. They'll give you a, a diagnosis like that, or they'll give you a, um, 
projection or almost a prophecy like that. They're talking about the future, your future. And they're saying, basically, you're going to have to deal with this indefinitely. It's not going anywhere. It's probably not going to get any better or whatever, what have you. But as the person on the receiving end or the potential receiving end, you have a choice to make. Do I receive this? Um, Am I going to fall a victim to this? Am I going to fall prey to this? Am I going to just lay down and die because they said I only have two days or two weeks or two months or two years or however long they have told you? You have, you have a choice in the matter. And um, that brings me to the Old Testament scripture found in the book of Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. And it says, death and life are in, catch that, in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. So I just stopped by to encourage you um, and discourage you, to encourage you not to take on all of the labels, not to take on or come into covenant or contract or um agreement with any and everything that is spoken over you, over your family, over your life, over your bloodline, over your generations and things of that nature. Um, because you have a choice in the matter. You don't have to receive everything that's spoken. That's why some people go to the doctor and they go to another doctor to get a second, third or fourth opinion because they are choosing to not go for or adhere to, um, just, you know, take hold of what somebody has, has told them. They may also look for more natural ways as opposed to medication or taking medication every day, which medication, every medication has a side effect, whether it's uh latent or manifest, whether you see it or not, because these are chemical uh, compositions and things that are not, even if they're things that are naturally found in your body, depending on the method in which you put it in, if is if your body is naturally supposed to be creating or making these things and you put in a artificial form or a manufactured form of that, it's going to have a different, uh, output or a different, um, effect on your your body your organs and things of that nature because you've put something there yes your body may already make this but it may not be making enough or it may not make any at all but you're putting it in um in a method that's not 100 percent natural or what have you so just wanted to stop by once again like i said encourage you to weigh the options encourage you to not just believe everything that you hear. Um, because here's the thing. If they tell you that you have this disorder, this diagnosis, this condition, research it. And guess what? You research it because you know what to pray against. And you know that you are to pray for the opposite. You know that you can go into the word of God and find scripture and to call those things that be not as though they were or what have you. So you don't have to accept anything, um, that somebody has spoken over you, especially if, and when it's not the will, um, uh, God's will for your life, when it's not your portion, when you think about a portion, you think I think about, uh, you know, how as mothers or as, you know, you could be, if you work at, at a restaurant or a fast food place or whatever, what have you, you lapse out a certain portion based upon what they've ordered, what they desire or, or what they've asked for or requested. Right. So, as a mother, I think about that. As my uh, my sons, you don't want to give somebody a, a larger portion or a portion that's not theirs or, you know, it could be somebody with a food allergy and they can't eat certain things. You don't want to give them the wrong thing or what have you. So you can, uh, you can accept or you can deny it and say, you know, that's not my portion. I don't receive that. I understand what the symptoms say, but I serve a God that... Uh, says in his word that healing is the children's bread. I serve a God that by Jesus Christ stripes, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, by his stripes, I am healed. You can speak healing. I serve a God that says he wishes above all things that I would prosper and be in good health, even as my soul prospers. So those are just some scriptures and some things to encourage you to speak over yourself, your family, speak over your finances, speak over your mind psychologically, or speak over your body biochemically. You speak to every organ, you speak to every blood vessel, you speak to, you speak that your heart will pump. You will not let your heart be troubled or whatever, what have you. You will, you have the mind of Christ. You know, there are scripture that you enlist during this time because 
God is listening for his word and he comes for his word. When you uh, look in scripture, there are some times where he said even to his disciples, oh, ye of little faith. Or he said, your faith has on the flip side. He's, he has said to people, your faith has made you whole. Faith is simply believing. He said in his word that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So it's not necessarily what you see. It's not necessarily what you hear, but it's what you choose to see is what you choose to you faith. Um, come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you speak the word of God and you, um, and that will build your faith and things of that nature. So I just stop by to encourage you, like I said, in one manner and discourage you in the other manner that you do not have to accept what someone says, what someone has spoken over you. And sometimes we feel like we do and you automatically come into agreement with it because you didn't, you didn't oppose it. You didn't repel it. You didn't reject it. You didn't renounce it or denounce it. So now you've taken it on because you took it in because a gateway to your soul, um, our souls is what you see and what you hear. So if you're hearing this and, and you don't say anything and you're just taking it in, you're just processing, it has now become a part and could <clears throat> potentially, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, could potentially become a part of your reality because you've just agreed to it unconsciously or subconsciously. So. Jesus. <clears throat> I proclaim, I decree, and I declare that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I'm more than a conqueror through Christ that loves me and gave himself for me. I proclaim, decree, and declare that this cough is not my portion. I proclaim, decree, and declare that I will continue to speak as an oracle of God. This is just an actual example of what you need to do and what's needed and necessary. You speak to any part of your body that might be out of line and you call it into divine alignment because you have that authority. <clears throat> so just know and note that. And also, that's all that I have. So I want you to remember that God and only God has the final say so about where you are now, where you have been. And where you are going because you are simply in the process of becoming who and what God created, ordained, designed, and destined you to be for his kingdom and for his glory. Until next time, miracles and blessings today and every day.